John Palmer joins me this week to discuss pale ales, IPAs, and water. This is Beersmith Podcast number 284. This is Beersmith Podcast number 284, and it's early July 2023. John Palmer joins me this week to discuss pale ales, IPAs, and water profiles. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also Beersmith Web, the online version of Beersmith Brewing Software. Beersmith for the Web lets you design great beer recipes from any browser, including your tablet or phone. Edit recipes on the go with access to tens of thousands of recipes, as well as the full suite of recipe building tools. Try Beersmith for the Web today by creating a free account at beersmithrecipes.com. And finally, a reminder to click that like and subscribe button on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or whatever platform you're listening on. Clicking those buttons is a great way to support the show. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome back John Palmer. John is the author of the top-selling homebrew book, How to Brew, as well as definitive book on brewing, Water. Uh, Today, he joins us to talk about IPAs, uh, pale ales, and water. John, it's uh, great to have you back on the show. How are you doing? Thanks very much. Yeah, it's great to be here. Doing great. Doing great. Awesome. Awesome. I, uh, it's been nine months, I think, since we last had you on the show. Uh, what have you been working on lately? I think you mentioned a new book a minute ago. Yeah, um, I've written a book called How to Brew in Your Kitchen, um, and it focuses on two and a half gallon or 10 liter batches no, uh, brew in a bag, no sparge on the kitchen stove. Uh, you know, smaller intro book to help people get into the hobby. That's really and cool. And it's published in Spanish. Yeah. In, Sp- in Spanish. Did you write it all in Spanish? No, no. They're going to have to go through the trouble of translating it. But uh, <laughs> I'm also working on the next edition of How to Brew. Are you really? That'll be, yeah. That'll take another couple of years. I was going to say, is that going to be a thousand pages? The last one was pretty hefty. Yeah. No, we're trying to, we're trying to streamline that. We're trying to slim it down a bit. Okay. Uh, It may, it may be time to safely lose a couple of the appendices and, you know, like on building your own gear and stuff. Um, Yeah. Yeah. We've kind of moved away from that, I think. Um, But yeah, I got to work on that in the next year or so. That's awesome. And I, if I recall, you were editing a few things as well, right? Oh, yeah. I, I'm in my job for the for the editing for the Master Brewers Association. Um, there's always another book there to work on. And uh, we've got some good ones coming out from the MBAA later this fall. That's cool. Well, great. Uh, well, today you wanted to talk about pale ales, uh, IPAs, and how water drives the flavor of beer. Um yeah. And you picked a couple different styles. So let's start with the first one, which is uh, British bitters. So can you talk a little about, first yeah. of all, the overall flavor profile and sort of the style, what it looked like? Yeah. It, it, we, we were, when you and I were talking last week about, you know, different water adjustments for different beer styles, mm-hmm. um, it kind of got me on this track of, you know, the evolution of American pale ale, and American IPA, and hazy IPA. And uh, I think it helps, it may help people wrap their head around water adjustment to uh, take these seemingly different styles and seemingly different waters and uh, help draw the, draw the dots, you know, draw the lines between the dots on how similar they really are. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, a little context helps round it out. So. Yeah, if we start with British bitters, you know, British pale ales, um, you know, in a word to describe British bitters, uh, moderation, I think, is the best descriptor. They have uh, moderate maltiness, moderate bitterness, uh, moderate hoppiness, hop character. 
And it all comes together in a very extremely drinkable uh, composition. Everything in moderation, nothing fighting each other, uh, just a very sublime uh, drinkability. But, but at, the, at the same time, there's some complexity there, too, I think, in terms of, you know, oh, yeah. there's a lot more off flavors, for example, in a British bitter than, you know, maybe a continental ale. Yeah. Uh, you can't have complexity without balance. And, you know, British beers are superbly balanced, nice balance between the malt and hops. So you can taste the different aspects of the maltiness, so, you know, the, uh, t- the touch of toast, the touch of caramel and the bread from the malt, and as well as your hop character, you've got a, uh, you know, a very well-balanced bitterness um, that is riding side by side with the maltiness. And in addition to that, you have a little bit of uh, hop aroma and flavor um, mm-hmm. from the dry hopping that they often do. So, yeah, just with with balance comes this complexity. Um the bitterness units to gravity units ratio of these beers is about 0.75 or, you know, three fourths. Mm-hmm. That is, the bitterness is about three fourths of the points that the gravity is. Um, so look at, uh, you know, there's three grades of British bitter, you know, uh, light, medium, and, and higher, uh, or large, I guess you'd say. Um, Anywhere from 35 up to, you know, 1035 up to 1060, I think, is mm-hmm. where it goes. And uh, so your bitterness at any gravity would be about three quarters of that. And so it is a more assertive uh, hop character in a British bitter than you would get, say, in a typical ale or a typical lager, um, Kolsch, Hellas, um, uh, other ales, golden Some ale. Co- yeah, continental styles and so on. Yeah, various kinds of styles. Typically, you're looking at a, gravity, um, a bitterness to gravity ratio of about one and a half mm-hmm. before those styles. You know, half the bitterness of the original gravity. Um, so British bitter coming in a little bit higher, around three quarters, makes that hop character more assertive. If you look at American craft brewing and home brewing, you can see where we took that concept of a hoppy British bitter and turned it up to 11. You know, as Americans, everything has to be more. So we added more hops and we brought that that hop character, the BU to GU, up to about 0.85. You know, another... Another little boost in bitterness, another little boost in dry hop character. Um, the and it made the the, the malt to hop balance become a little bit more hop forward. Mm-hmm. Same gravities, um, and for a while there, we were doing the same thing with the malt bill as well. We were adding more caramel, we were adding more Munich, and this really was the birth of the American amber ale style. Mm-hmm. You know, when you start when you start adding more caramel, adding more maltiness, and you know, changing it from uh, amber up to you know, say copper uh, color, um, you know, increasing the sweetness. Now you need more hops to balance it, and thus that you know evolved into American amber. And then um, you know, the other other thing I find interesting is, of course, they changed the yeast, right? So. A lot of yeah. the complexity you get from the British yeast, uh, maybe not so present in the American version. Exactly right. Yeah. Switched to American yeast, American hop character. And yeah, it became a uniquely American style, uh, readily differentiable you know, in tasting. Um, um, well, stepping back for a second, though, uh, what does the water profile look like? Because that's one of the things you want to focus on uh, for the original right. bitters. Okay, so uh, we're looking towards London uh, for the British bitters, and I'm sure you know every region of, of England has their own uh, bitter style that goes back hundreds of years. Um, but uh, the water around London is um, high, uh, moderate hardness or medium hardness and high alkalinity. 
uh, meaning that the residual alkalinity was a positive value. Um, I think it's about 0.75, 0.85, something like, or 75 or 85 uh, residual alkalinity, mm -hmm. which means that you need more dark malts in the grain bill to balance that alkalinity in the mash to get good yield. Um, keep in mind that when these beer styles are being developed, pH wouldn't be invented till 1920 or something like that. Mm. So, uh, yeah, they were figuring it out purely from an extract and yield uh, point of view. Um, and the, the water, the London water, also had a balanced sulfate to chloride ratio, kind of one to one. Um, not terribly assertive, both of the numbers around 50 ppm, 40 to 50 ppm. So just right under just that threshold. Mm -hmm. um, for the practice of Burtonization, um, if, this is kind of interesting. Burton, the beers of Burton were recognized as being special and unique. Um, uh, during this, even during the 1600s, probably by 1650, definitely by 1700, there were people writing about the unique beers of the Burton-on-Trent region. And the Burton-on-Trent region had uh, much higher hardness uh, water, than, higher in than London, calcium yeah. sulfate. Yeah, than, higher than London. Burton-on-Trent, Burton for <laughs> those of us here in the States, uh, it's about 120 miles north of London, mm -hmm. so it's you know it's not really close to London. Um, and uh, one, I think, one misconception among American homebrewers was that Burton Ale was an IPA, or and that's not really the case. A Burton Ale was a lar, a big you know 1060 kind of gravity, but a sweeter beer didn't have the depth of hop character that an IPA does. Now, they had bitter stock ales, the bales that they would uh, store for a period of time, and that they did add hops to. And those beers were the ones that became the IPAs of the day. And IPAs were being shipped to India and elsewhere in the, in the empire um, mid uh, early to mid 1700s on. Um, so it was just kind of a gradual replacement of Burton Ale with the bitter stock ale, is, you know, which was the most popular beer in the region. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then that, they rec even though they didn't have the concept of pH at the time, they had the chemistry that uh, let them understand that the water of Burton on Trent is what allowed this uh, clarity in the in their ales and their burden ales, and that technology um, lent the same appearance to their stock ale. Um, it ha led to a higher sulfate character, referred to as the Burton Snatch. Um, a little bit of the uh, sulfur coming out in the in the aroma of the beer, um, and so. Burtonization as a science and an improvement to brewing water um, was known, uh, and by roughly 1850, mm -hmm. uh, that that concept and that science was also uh, made known in Europe. And uh, I was talking to uh, Professor Ludwig Narcissus a few years ago. And he commented that the when they developed the Pilsen beers, they employed Burtonization of their water to brew a brighter, clearer Pilsner beer in in Pilsen. And of course, the uh, the sulfate uh, driving it up doesn't changes a lot of things, right? What else does it change? Yeah, the sulfate dries out the character. You know, the overall uh, malt character of the beer mm -hmm. makes that beer more crisp. Um, it accentuates the hop character, making it more assertive, yet uh, fading faster on the palate. Um, it, uh, yeah, it's a, the, you mentioned it adds clarity, yeah. Yeah, it's clarity. The higher, you know, the, 
Burton water is both high hardness and high sulfate, basically high in gypsum. And so the higher calcium, uh, it really aids in beer clarity. And, uh, and yeah, it has a profound effect on yeast flocculation, trub formation, uh, et cetera. So you, you just naturally get a much clearer beer in a high, in a high hardness, high calcium water uh, than you do than, say, the London water, which had medium hardness and high alkalinity. Um, so, I mean, that obviously changed things quite a bit for uh, pale ales, like uh, I'm thinking of the classic bale, bass pale ale, for example. Right. Um, right. Now let's go and maybe switch, switch gears back to American pale ale, uh, which came, uh, you know, along with American amber, uh, were developed uh, yep. sort of in the early craft beer days. Uh, can you yeah. talk a little bit about those styles and, and how those compare to their English counterparts? Sure. So, you know, as, as home brewers, and, and you and I were in the thick of things, you know, 30 years ago, yeah. uh, discovering all this stuff for the first time, um, we, you know, we were enamored of the tales of Burton on Trent and brewing these, these hoppy, crisp, you know, bass ales and Burton ales and IPAs and so on. Uh, so I remember when I first wrote How to Brew, you know, in the late nineties. Um, oh, it's funny. I remember how much of an, an aside my IPA recipe was at that time. It was, you know, the, in the first edition of how to brew it was victory and chaos, British IPA, no American IPA, just a British IPA. There it is. And it was just like something to include. It wasn't the, it wasn't the main styles that were being brewed back then. Um, be, those being pale ale, uh, porter and stout, and, or, or amber and stout and stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we, like I said, we were enamored with more, more hops, uh, more, more calcium sulfate. And so you, we saw all these suggestions to add calcium sulfate to all of our recipes. Uh, back then, which made that hop character more assertive. And um, like you said, with the addition of American yeast and American hop, uh, hop varieties led to, you know, American pale ale. Well, that same mindset, we took British, pale, uh, British IPA and brought it into the fold, added American yeast, American hop character, higher hardness, higher, and the high sulfate that we thought was the, you know, the key to brewing these styles. Uh, and that led to the development of American IPA or West Coast IPA, as it's kind of referred to today. Mm -hmm. um, less emphasis on the malt side, although many of the IPAs back then were quite, you know, amber colored. I mean, they were, you know, anywhere from uh, 8, 10, 12 SRM. Uh, whereas now they're more firmly in the, say, the five, you know, three, five, seven kind of range for today. Mm -hmm. uh, they've become paler. Um, but yeah, we took, you know, the higher strength of the English IPA, um, you know, going from roughly 1060, now kind of bumping that up to 1070, and uh, embraced that, kicked it up even to 1075, added you know, more hops, more assertive character. And with American IPA, we were approaching the uh, a one-to-one -one bitterness unit to gravity unit ratio. Again, making that hop character even more hop forward. And that, the, sorry, the balance of the beer more hop forward than uh, American pale ale. Mm -hmm. Did you... Um how did how did the water profiles evolve over this time? You mentioned that you know uh, in England, obviously we had the London water, uh, which mm -hmm. had a certain profile profile, and we had the Burton on Trent water, which had a certain profile. Um, and yeah. I know in the early days we didn't necessarily play a lot with water profiles, except a lot of us were adding gypsum, I think, uh, at that point. Yeah. But how did the water uh, profiles for the the styles change as we Americanized them? Well. And that's 
that's kind of hard to define because you're right. For a long time, we really didn't understand. I, I, for, for example, did not understand how water profiles worked. Um, I felt that, you know, yeah, we needed to increase the hardness and we needed to adjust the alkalinity somehow. But um, all of that was kind of uh, at least a little bit intangible. And uh, A.J. DeLang and others, uh, Martin, for example, helped us uh, codify that and, uh, and helped me understand it. And that's how I wrote the water book. But um, what we basically did was I said, okay, we're trying to emulate this Burton on Trent water to make great IPAs to get the, this crisp hop character. Um, then we started understanding, okay, that, that 800 ppm sulfate was a, not a real value. I mean, yes, it was the real value of the groundwater if you dig down in Burton on Trent and analyze that, but you have to have to realize, and this is what comes out when you read, read Mitch Steele's IPA book, mm -hmm. uh, or one of Ron Pattinson's works or Mark, Martin Cornell's works, uh, you realize that they were brewing from wells that were drilled halfway between the brewery and the river. And the river, of course, had much lower uh, hardness, much lower alkalinity calcium sulfate. So they were really brewing with a blend of the river, the soft river water and this hard groundwater. So let's just say that we'll cut those uh, sulfate numbers in half, you know, to say 400 max. Which um, is still very, very high. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's still quite high. And it definitely contributed to the, the character and mystique that these beers had. Um, and so in trying to emulate that, um, we were also doing higher and higher calcium sulfate additions. As we came to understand um, how, those, how those calcium sulfate additions uh, affected pH mash and understood where we wanted to be in the mash for good conversion, um, we started, you know, kind of moderating all of these uh, guidelines and kind of bring them down to more realistic numbers. So, yeah, we were brewing very high hardness, high cal high sulfate IPAs for quite a while. Um, and then we've kind of di since dialed it back to much more palatable uh, numbers. Uh, also numbers that don't leave quite as much uh, calcium carbonate scale in the uh, hot liquor tanks and mash tons. Yeah. I remember, yeah, using a lot of gypsum, as particular, particularly back in the day. Um, yeah. I did have a question, though. Uh, going back to the, you know, we talked about bitter and we talked about uh, the Burton on Trent styles. Um, a traditional British IPA, do you have any historical sources to have any idea what the water may have looked like or perhaps where they were made? Well, um, they were being brewed in several areas. Uh, I mean, the Burton region... Um, and uh, forgive me, I'm not the beer historian that other people are. That's okay. Um, there, the I forget the name of the I think one of the popular breweries there, Hull or Holden. Anyway, yeah, they they were brewing with the Burton water, the higher calcium, higher sulfate water, and then um, they were also being brewed elsewhere with you know. Much softer kind of water, I assume. Yeah. With, with, with softer water, but still highly hopped. Still uh, basically a stock ale, an ale that would be you know, fermented, dry hopped in the barrel, and then those barrels left to sit for a year before they would be consumed. And so uh, the original IPA probably was... Uh, had a certain amount of Brett character to it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, Orval may be the last surviving traditional, you know, or real IPA out there um, mm -hmm. in terms of its hop character and, and Brett character mm -hmm. um, for a stock ale. Um, as, you know, but as we move forward in time, you know, the Brett 
the Brett character went away. And so now, uh, and then at the same time, um, you know, in the 20th century, uh, hop prices, malt prices, the wars, you know, uh, beer gravities have come down, um, refrigeration happened so that they didn't need the high hop character, the, the high bitterness to travel well. Um, and I could, I could go off on a tangent into American adjunct lager and the origins of that in, from the you know, late 1850 on, uh, up into the early 1900s, um, Less bitter beers were extremely popular, and you know people wanted American lager. It was clear, it didn't form chill haze, it didn't uh, spoil, um, you know, didn't get, get infected as much. Um, it was a much more flavor stable uh, product, and it was less bitter, and people liked that. Um, so yeah, the popularity of these heavy Bitter stock ales really plummeted uh, in the latter half of the 19th century to the 20th century. Mm. Makes sense, yeah. And also, I think you know, there's a lot of local options available too uh, coming on oh, the yeah. market at yeah. various places. So we didn't necessarily have to ship it uh, across the world. Um, yeah. So walking through the different styles, so let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the modern styles. Uh, so like an amber or a original pale ale, and I'm using, a, say, maybe, you know, sort of like a traditional American pale ale, maybe something like a Sierra Nevada. I assume they didn't do a lot of water adjustment at that point, right? Because we didn't have a lot of this knowledge at that point when a lot of these beers were made. Right. Yeah. I, they were adding uh, calcium salts. Um, mm-hmm. And... Uh, the the water up in Chico, for example, is a moderate hardness, uh, kind of balanced profile, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the 50 to 75 ppm uh, range for calcium and, or for uh, sulfate and chloride, but it you know is a more balanced uh, profile. Um, the addition of calcium sulfate would help bring out that hop character a bit more, um, but. It really was a fairly medium level water, moderate level water, not super high hardness, not super high sulfate, um, and, and it provided um, a good uh, balance between the malt and hop characters. Um, as and the same went for amber ale, um, pretty much brewed at the same water, um, and in many breweries across the United States. Um, especially uh, some of the Eastern breweries, um, they're being brewed with surface water. So it was, they were soft water sources. Right. So right. yeah, uh, kind of low mineral and made the beers overall a bit softer um, as opposed to the, uh, the, the, the American IPA. Um, and then as we, we move had it, that, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. I was just saying, I was just going to finish with saying that we had that ideal of Burton, you know, for uh, the IP style. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then as we move forward into, uh, we see the American IPA style start to come on the market, I guess in the, Oh, I don't know, mid aughts or something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, did we have, I assume we still didn't have a lot of water knowledge then, but we were probably still kind of following along with kind of the Burtonization approach or what? Yeah. Yeah. It was, that was very much the, the era of the classic brewing cities, you know, profiles. Yeah. And so, yeah, people were doing water adjustments based on matching these classic brewing cities. Again, not really tying it and there's, you know, tying those additions to their source water and mash pH. Um, pH was, you know, known and we would talk about, you know, 5.4, 5.2 pH. Um, that we would see in brewing, in like German brewing textbooks and some of the other, uh, you know, multi brewing science textbooks out there. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was it was coming together. It was coming together. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, of course, you put you published the water book, and about that time, I I started to hear people get a little bit more serious about their water, and and of course, I'm sure it affected uh, the commercial IPA brewing as well. Yeah. Um, 
it's funny. I mean, even still today, I'm when I do my occasional consulting job on water adjustment, uh, especially for contract breweries, they will be given a recipe and told, here is what you do. Here are all the salts that you put in and all the malts that you use and hops and so on. And they brew it with no regard to what their source water already has in it versus the original source water. Which is a big so problem. There's still, yeah, there's still that disconnect. But, you know, it's getting better. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we were drilling down to, you know, exactly how much, uh, adjustment was needed. Um, I remember, oh yeah, back in the early or late nineties, early two thousands, um, the idea, there was talk of kettle pH being more important than mash pH for a good beer, Mm. you know? Wrong, but you know, a little bit wrong. Not totally wrong, but a little bit wrong. Um, but you know, it it comes from the idea that if you have the mash pH right to get the optimum conversion and yield from your malt, then that chemistry, that you know, that well coordinated chemistry is going to continue on through the brewing process. And so, yeah, if you have the right mash pH, it's going to mean you have the right work pH going into the kettle and that after the boil, that pH is going to be uh, very favorable for fermentation as well. So it's, uh, you know, it wasn't completely wrong, but it was just slightly wrong emphasis and not understanding the way it flowed down. Um, I feel like I'm getting off track again. No, no, you're (laughs) good. You're good. Um, well, I want to bring one more style into the mix, which, of course, is the hazy uh, New England IPA, which is uh, kind of a unique beast uh, from a water perspective. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yeah. the style, how it differs from the other IPAs? And then, of course, we want to dive into the water profile for that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great uh, topic, too. So. American IPA, it, you know, as you said, it had its. It had its growth spurt in the early aughts. Um, by 2010, you know, they had been around. We had done red IPAs, brown IPAs, black IPAs, white IPAs. We had done every IPA we could think of. Well, and, and, and not, to, not to downplay it, but they, they still make up over half the craft beer made in the United States. So I mean, it's still a substantial yeah. thing. Yeah, but, yeah. But yeah, go ahead. Silver were widely popular, but, you know, there's like, where is this going next? Well, um, late hopping, more hops, you know, that was, that, um, more hops is always a passion for American home brewers and craft brewers. And of course they found that by adding them later in the process, you preserve more oil, get more oil and more aroma into that beer. Mm-hmm. And, um, in the Northeast, uh, this led to, you know, somebody, it might've been Trillium, it might've been uh, Treehouse or one of the others, uh, you know, all late hop additions, no hops in the boil. And the beer turned out hazy. Uh, but, you know, they, it also had massive hop aroma and a massive hop flavor. And it had a kind of a juicy character to it. You know, we were re- they were realizing more uh, hop character doing that method with a hazier IPA versus the crystal clear standard of the West Coast IPA you know, Green Flash, Stone, Russian River, et cetera, um, you know, the, and Firestone, those were all crystal clear West Coast IPAs in there. And now we have this hazy Northeast IPA uh, and with, with, you know, better, deeper hop aroma. And that was the birth of the hazy style. Now, in experimenting with that, they, you know, added uh, some more wheat, more oats to the style, helped uh, increase the head retention, made it fluffier tasting. Um, And when you start looking into how to enhance that, that juicy fruity character, uh, you've got to, you've got to look at pH. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one, one, downside to lots of dry hopping and whirlpool hopping without boiling is that your hops raise the pH of the wort and the pH of the beer. 
and I think, oh, nuts, I don't have the number in front of me. Um, it's like, I think one pound per barrel uh, raises the pH like 0.4, almost one half, you know, unit. Substantial, so yeah. As, yeah, so as you add more and more hops, late, late, you know, whirlpool hopping, dry hopping, the beer pH starts rising considerably. Uh, it can become, uh, the beer can become coarser tasting, more astringent, uh, more coating, you know, to your palate. And uh, so we are still adding the same amount of calcium salt, but we're adding more calcium chloride because that accentuates the maltiness and backs off a bit on the, uh, the assertiveness of the hop character, makes it softer uh, and makes the beer balance a little bit maltier and sweeter um, and less aggressive. Uh, probably but, uh, probably uh, the extra sweetness uh, complements the, the fruity flavors too from the hops, I would think. It really does. And that's an aspect of the juiciness character that people were looking for that made, made the beer more approachable to the public for, you know, uh, than previous IPAs had been. Um, but the other aspect to, to juiciness and fruitiness is acidity. Because as you know, if you bite into an orange or an apple or other piece of fruit, those are fairly acidic uh, items. And so um, a lot of brewers these days do acid adjust adjustments um, po post-fermentation to bring that pH back down. You know, during, during dry hopping, beer pH can rise up to uh, 5.6. Wow, um, and you know, back up to almost mash level from the the four point four four point six it was. I guess five point six is kind of extreme, but uh, it can rise a lot. And so they would do acid additions to bring that back down to the four point two four point four range, which is more typical of a pale beer. Hmm. Interesting. So they're actually, I assume, adding some kind of acid uh, post mat or post post brewing. I guess right. Yeah. yeah, typically phosphoric. You can also use lactic uh, or a combination thereof. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the water profile then is almost the opposite of what you have for an IPA in a lot of ways, right? Right. Well, it's it's the same. It's it's the same in terms of calcium and alkalinity. You want hardness. You don't want alkalinity. You want a negative residual alkalinity to help bring that mash pH down you know, to your target 5.2 to 5.6 at room temperature. Um, but to do that, you know, you've, you've got to, uh, you're, you're also brewing a paler beer. So, yeah, you're often adding additional acid to that high hardness uh, to help that high hardness along. Uh, it's hard without the specialty malts um, that add acidity. It's hard to get the pH down with malts alone. Hmm. Um, so they're do, usually adding some acid uh, to the hot liquor tank or to the mash ton to help get the initial pH down. But they're switch, swapping out the calcium salt, whereas before we were using calcium sulfate to really accentuate the hop character, make it dry, more assertive, more aggressive. Now they're switching to calcium chloride. Calcium chloride accentuates the malt character makes the beer taste a little bit sweeter, uh, makes that hop character uh, a little softer, and uh, overall the, the focus of the beer switches from an aggressively bitter beer to a huge, soft, hoppy beer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that distinction. Yeah, yeah. So um, we're getting to the end, but I was wondering if we could walk back through the uh, different different styles that we talked about today, maybe starting with the bitter and, and the Burton on Trent and so on, and just describe yeah. the water profiles for each, uh, you know, for, so it can help homebrewers uh, maybe target each of them. Yeah. So, yeah, British bitter, um, you're looking for a balanced sulfate to chloride ratio, one to one or near one to one somewhere in the 50 to 75 ppm range for both sulfate and chloride. Uh, you're looking for moderate hardness. Again, seven, you know, 50 to 75 calcium is a good number. Um, you're going to have, typically have uh, 
medium to high alkalinity that could be 75 to 100 ppm of bicarbonate or total alkalinity. Um, your residual alkalinity is typically going to be positive somewhere in the 50 to 100 range. Mm -hmm. And you're going to rely on the specialty malts that you're adding to these British bitters to help bring that pH down back into that 5.2 to 5.6 range. Uh, so again, medium hardness, medium to high alkalinity, you know, but you're putting up with that. <laughs> it's yeah. not a goal, it's just what it is. Uh, and then medium sulfate and chloride, 50 mm -hmm. to 75. Yeah. And then uh, switching to a Burton over. ale, uh, for example, different? Burton, yep, Burton ale. Now we're moving, you know, from London up to Burton. And now we have higher hardness, 75 to 125 calcium, and anywhere from 400 to 500 sulfate, typically, uh, in the diluted water they're getting with the river. Um, hard to know exactly, but uh, different breweries did different things. Uh, but yeah, you're generally higher hardness, higher sulfate, uh, and you get a much more hop assertive beer. And then, uh, cor of course, switching over to the United States, let's talk about the early amber and pale ales. What kind of a profile would they have? Yep. We are imitating that same uh, kind of profile, but with softer, you know, typically softer water, surface waters um, in the eastern half of the country. Um, and, uh, again, adding some calcium sulfate, generally looking at the same kind of levels as British bitter, uh, 75 to 100 calcium. So probably pretty uh, moderate 50. water, not not the Burton on Trent then, right? Right, right. Um, 50 to 75 calcium, or sorry, sulfate, 50 to 75 uh, chloride. Mm -hmm. uh, sodium, you know, can what be whatever. Uh, when you go to American IPA as a step for that, now we crank up the calcium sulfate. We make more additions, and we're taking that uh, calcium level to 100, 150 range, you know, a high range. Again, the same with the sulfate, anywhere from 100, 150, up to 300 in some cases, uh, you know, in the 2010s. Uh, Which, of course, is going to accentuate the, uh, the hoppiness in the beer, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And then with the advent of hazy IPAs uh, and the evolution of those, we flip the sulfate and chloride around. Still high calcium, or and maybe that's come, that comes down a little bit, you know, more around the 100 ppm max. Um, but we're taking that chloride up to 150 ppm with, uh, say, only 50 to 75 ppm of sulfate. So, I mean, you, you, when we look at the sulfate to chloride ratio, which is sort of the, you know, ratio of bitterness, um, is it almost inverted there from a regular IPA? Yes. Basically? Yes. Wow. So yeah. that's cool. Whereas a sulfate to chloride in a West Coast IPA would be something like uh, two to one or four to one. Um, the sulfate to chloride in a, in a hazy IPA would be one to two or one to three. Hmm. So almost inverted, yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, well, uh, John, I was wondering uh, maybe if you could just close with the overall uh, role water plays in uh, in a lot of the modern beer styles, and uh, and also maybe some comments on where you see us going from here. Yeah, um, I think I've, I've I try to keep this in perspective to people. Water is an important aspect of brewing. It is that final ten percent of the flavor profile, if you will. You know, being able to adjust the sulfate and chloride and the hardness to alkalinity to really dial in the right pH for the beer and the right flavor balance, the sulfate to chloride, hoppiness to maltiness. Where you put that balance is that final adjustment that you make to a great beer, just like, you know, the final seasoning a great chef does to a dish. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you know, you can brew good beer with any water out there, any clean water out there. It's when you understand 
the nuances of seasoning and uh, fine-tuning pH that can allow you to really uh, open it up to the next level. Awesome, John. Well, uh, thank you again for coming on the show. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's a great pleasure today to have my good friend, John Palmer. Uh, John is the author of the top-selling homebrew book in the world still, uh, which is called How to Brew, as well as the definitive book on brewing uh, called Water. John, thank you again for coming on the show. Thank you, Brad. A big thank you to John Palmer for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also Beersmith Web, the online version of Beersmith Brewing Software. Beersmith for the Web lets you design great beer recipes from any browser, including your tablet or your phone. Edit recipes on the go with access to tens of thousands of recipes, as well as the full suite of recipe building tools. Try Beersmith Web today by creating a free account at beersmithrecipes.com. Again, that's beersmithrecipes.com. And finally, a reminder to click that like and subscribe button on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or whatever platform you're listening on. Clicking those buttons is a great way to support the show. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.